What's up, humans? Welcome back to the Human Music Podcast. I'm Luke Rain, and this is episode 65 Common Producer Mistakes. Uh, our guy Slap Silla over on YouTube asked, What are the most damaging production practices that objectively always make your track sound worse, if any? So we covered blindly putting the same effect on all your elements, not focusing on how an effect changes the sound, testing multiple plugins for the same job, gain staging, limiting false beliefs, misusing filters and EQs, and much, much more. There is a ton of good info on this one about a lot of stuff we've learned the hard way that maybe you won't have to. Make sure to take a minute, click the links below to support our sponsors. They're dope producer and engineer resources that help us and can help you. First up, Dojo TV, where you can get free producer live stream classes from the producer Dojo Senseis. If you want to step it up above that, the weekly download where you can learn from Ill Gates and his private weekly group lessons and get access to over 230 more episodes in the archive for just 20 bucks a month. An insane value. There is so much there. Finally, guest practices where you can learn from Seth Drake at the Approach Institute. Hands down, the best engineer we know. And over there, your first class is free. All those links are down below, along with links to the song of the week, which is Rip Kenny's remix of the Eye on Eyes track, Look What I Got, featuring 42 Doug, Kevin Jacobs, and Dez Eagle. The whole remix EP is bangers. There is also remixes from Ill Gates, from Eprom, from Ahi, and from Kraz. All the flavors over there, but this, as you can hear, is a jam. All right, let's get into this episode, y'all. We got a bunch to cover. Hello, people of Earth. This is Tesco with Rip Kenny and Trap Jesus, and you're listening to the uh, Human Music Podcast. Woo! Human Music Podcast. I like it. What's up, humans? It's the Human Music Podcast. We're back at you again. I'm Luke Rain, here with Rip Kenny and Tesco. About to tell you how to be a goddamn producer, believe it. Believe believe that. That is the thing we talk about. Woo. In general. Woo. Woo. Yes. In general and occasionally. Oh yeah, man! At and least vocationally, generally once a week is the occasion. Uh, <laughs> they drop on Tuesdays. You're hearing yes, this sir. today, which is someday in the future from now. Congratulations Not... if you're listening. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. congratulations! Thanks for finding us. We appreciate you. Yes, you know. Uh, well, today we got uh, another question from friend of the pod, Slap Silla. Drop this in a YouTube comment on a, on an episode from a couple weeks back. Slapsilla asks, what are the most damaging production practices that objectively always make your tracks sound worse? What are these, you know, these are the kind of things that every producer probably continually through their whole career has been doing something that they thought was helpful to their tracks and then find out something either from somebody who knows more and is like, yeah, you you should probably stop doing that, homie, or you just finally figured out and you realize, oh, the reason this track's fucked up is because this chunk of processing I always do, and this is why I can never finish mixing shit. Um, there are definitely multiple things I can think of that that I've done in the past that have messed stuff up, and I'm sure you guys have it too. So who, who wants to get started on on talking about something? Who's Who's got a hot take? Evan, would you like the honors here? I, I, would, I would love the honors. Yay! Because I have... I have I have many things that come that that come to mind. Yeah, in sausage like the, fattener on everything. Every <laughs> no, day. Right back you to know, episode dude, I, one. Actually, though, that is a <laughs> decent place to start. Which is like in year two of production, like <laughs> I would put sausage fattener on so many things because I didn't really understand what it was doing. I just know that it made it louder and then it made it like brighter. And like some, like I would pretty much just like throw it on something that was important in the song, turn it up to like 15% and then turn the color up to like 
between 80 and 100% and be like, I know for a fact that's going to make it chonky. And then like, cool, move on. Like, what? Like that, that, that kind of leads into my point that I was getting to, which I wanted to start with, which is never blindly apply something that worked before on the next thing without listening to it and using your gut instinct, using your feel. Like, does this sound like it fits? I can't tell you how many times I've, I've, in, in my early years of production, I watched a YouTube tutorial or found something that worked and was like, okay, sick. This works good. I'm going to do this on everything like this from here forwards. That is how you ruin stuff because every track is different. Every puzzle piece in every track, every lead fits in a little bit differently than the last one. And if you just start doing the same thing on everything, unless it's all of the same instruments, it's not going to work, right? A perfect example for me um, was the first time I learned how to like, you know, use a visualizer on like a, a spectrum analyzer. And, and I was like, okay, so let's look at my waveform, my track, and let's compare it to this knife party song. Oh, wow. This knife party song is like completely full in the spectrum and it sounds really great. Uh, let's look at my track. Oh, okay. It's lacking from 400 hertz to... 1200 hertz it's lacking about 60 b of oomph on the thing that i'm looking at let's just take all my main sounds and haggardly create some boost thing that looks like it would take up the space that's missing and just slap that on all these things and and that'll fix the problem right that'll give me that'll fill the space no it just creates a bunch of freaking mud that like sure boost up those areas on the visualizer on the spectrum analyzer like like yeah visually it looks like it fixed the problem but i wasn't listening to what it was doing like a, it made it worse and instead of doing the correct solution which is like actually using maybe another element quietly to help beef up that sound or picking the right sound to begin with that has some natural frequency content in those areas, you know, you're just throwing a bandaid on the problem and not actually like solving it. Right. So that's, that's my first one using a technique or, or using your eyes to try and fix a problem rather than listening to it and objectively thinking to yourself, like, what is this actually doing? What do you guys, what do you guys think about that? Amen. This is what I think. Amen to that. I, I've definitely been guilty of like looking for a one size fits all solution. Like, oh, once I dial in this vocal template, oh, once I dial in this mixing template, like I won't have to worry about it again. And 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 just kind of hoping that like, you know, that that tutorial you saw or that plugin that you got is is perfectly going to solve your problem, not only in this context that you're currently working on, but in all future contexts where you have insert same instrument or similar instruments yeah absolutely uh i've definitely you know i think i think that's one thing that people get wrong about templates we've talked about how helpful templates can be a bunch on the program but i think some of the pushback is that well i know that if people with this foresight to know that not one solution will work for every problem you know everything's not a nail don't always grab the hammer Right. And that's a good instinct. But I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding of like what a template is and why you have it. It's not that I've already got the entire signal chain laid out and I just drop my vocal into it and say, OK, that'll probably work. It's about having the most necessary routing or the most common routing already set up and having the most you know, vital tools that you're generally always going to use at your fingertips so that you can just turn them on really quick if that's what you need right here. It's not about just blindly dropping something into a set of processing, just like it's not about blindly dropping processing onto a track. Exactly. Totally. I, there was, <laughs> there's like this like mix tips series 
uh, on YouTube that I would I would listen to like two or three on the way to, on the way to work and the way home from work every day. And there's like a hundred tips. And I was like, once I get all these hundred tips, I'm gonna be sick at mixing. Yeah. And like one of them was like when you record a kick drum, typically there's too much 400 hertz, which creates a lot of like throaty resonance that's that 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 screws up your 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 bass guitar and so you're gonna want to cut 400 hertz out of the kick drum that you recorded and i'm like cool i'm gonna cut 400 hertz out of all my kick drums so like on the template i would just have an eq that cut out like three to six i don't remember what it was like three to six dbs at 400 hertz and like did that to every kick like and then i'm like why does my kick feel like it doesn't have any thud. It's because uh, I didn't record the kick drum. Why the fuck am I taking 400 hertz out of it? Someone already thought about this. Like, per- perfect example of just, yeah. yeah, you can't do that. Yeah, that's. I think that's a really important thing to tell people about is think about the context of where this advice is coming from. That advice was coming from a person who is recording live instruments in a real space and then having to deal with the shortcomings of what that instrument actually sounds like hitting that microphone and what people expect a modern recording to sound like. Because that is one specific context. What is an actual big round kick drum booming in a room sound like when you close mic it? As opposed to, what is this electronically generated waveform that somebody made with a piece of software and then processed and then put in a pack that you downloaded off Splice? It's a completely different situation. And it's, you know, again, no one size fits all approach to any of this. Like, yeah. and then, you know, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of really good advice out there that is specifically for live music or electronic music. And sometimes you can learn something in one realm that will apply to the other, but you've got to like stop and take it with that grain of salt. Like this person is recording a pop punk song and I am doing a dubstep song and I recorded none of these elements. And a lot of this advice just does not apply here. Yeah. 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 I mean, totally. Yeah. I mean, that guy made like Christian rock. Like how how oh, I how I expect revolution? Yeah, yeah, yeah like I, how, I how we might be talking was. about, <laughs> dude. How I expected that to apply? I have no fucking idea. I mean, I feel like you kind of have to go through a phase where you just keep screwing it up from track mm-hmm. to track because True. it's like those hard lessons where you realize, like, man, I severely messed up my last twenty tracks by blindly following this. Those are the moments where it kind of teaches you you know, to not do these things. I think, uh, you know, what I'd suggest for people is like, you know, go in and like, take this advice you see on YouTube, but don't get too attached to it. Like, if you come back to the project two days later, and that kick isn't sounding how you want, or that synth isn't sounding how you want, there is no shame in highlighting your whole effects chain and hitting delete and starting over. And, And I really, really recommend people actually take some time to relatively like uh, make sure that their volumes are consistent as the signal passes through the chain Mm -hmm. that way you're not like being misled by volume when you're when you're uh, trying to reference if this plugin is actually making it sound better or not and then um, i want to pause you real quick because that is so important when you are making any change to a sound or the song as a whole if you are compressing, if you are EQing, if you are saturating or distorting, all of this stuff, put a utility, if you're in Ableton or whatever can like volume adjust the track and create a little group or whatever that you can basically turn on and off to turn on the effect and also simultaneously turn the volume down and make sure that when you turn the effect on and off, It is the same relative volume. So you can A, B your change without thinking that you made it better blindly just because it's louder. Anytime you make a change that makes something louder, your ears are naturally going to tell you that it's better because 
things that are louder sound better to us. That's why you always turn your favorite song up when you're listening to it because it sounds better loud, right? You need to do that to be able to objectively see, did I make this better or worse? I That is such a big tip. Yeah, and totally. that's why almost every plugin has a makeup gain knob mm-hmm. on it. Like there's an out gain at the end of the whole chain of all the things you just did to the sound, whether it's a compressor or whatever, like they've got a makeup gain. And that's so when you hit that bypass knob, you can set it so that makeup game makes it the same volume relatively that it came in. The overall yeah. volume when you hit that bypass and turn it back on should not change the loudness of that element. It should change the dynamic range or exactly. the frequency response or something else, but keep it so that the volumes are relatively the same. That's such an important point. And I think yeah. a lot of people assume that they helped out a, an element in a song and didn't. Yeah. Just so like, because it, it got louder. Anytime you compress, turn off the makeup gain. Like turn off or the automatic makeup gain. If you're using the glue compressor in Ableton, it's it's not on. If you're using the regular compressor, you do have to turn it off. The EQ8 comes with a gain slider in the bottom right. Use that both ways. If you have to take some frequencies out, turn it up so that when you turn it off and on, you can be like, did it make it better or worse? And if you have Pro-Q, there is an auto gain function that will volume match automatically. It is in the bottom right, there's a little menu you pop up and it's like an A button that you turn on and it'll solve it for you. But the, use that. Use that to your advantage to not trick yourself into thinking you made something better when you made it worse. Big up pro. Amen. Um, yeah, yeah. That's such an important point. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you guys highlighted that because that's definitely something that I did in the beginning. And I see a lot of students doing where they'll, they'll just use a plugin to, to make it sound louder. They'll, they'll chuck on a compressor or they'll, they'll put some saturation or they'll do this or that when the element doesn't actually need it. And they're trying to, you know, get uh, that they have a different motive and they're choosing, uh, they're just kind of stacking plugins on top of plugins on top of plugins to to try to achieve that. But then what that does is like, once you start overcomplicating your mix, not only does it start making the sounds uh, feel very like digitally and overproduced and artificial, but, um, you know, I to each their own, but I'm a huge fan of a more minimalist approach because I find when you can reserve specific plugins for specific instruments and not use the same compressor on everything, the same saturator on everything, the same whatever on everything, it helps things stand out in the mix more. And one thing I've noticed, um, like let's say in Ableton, you have a glue compressor. I know uh, SSL and Slate have similar like group uh, or bus compressors and, and people will be using those style of compressors on an individual kick, an individual snare, uh, which, you know, always experiment. But the thing is, if you're going to use it on the individual kick, individual snare on your hi-hat group, and then on the whole drum group, and then you're also going to use it on your basses and then on your vocals and then like on the mix the, bus and then on the mix bus, it's like the algorithm is, is created in such a way where it's going to emphasize uh, where it's going to uh, like compress or, or it's going to give this like certain color to uh, to whatever like you're affecting, whether it's the saturation or, or the compressor or whatever. And, and it's, it's going to start building up these frequencies that kind of just make everything feel mushy and not together. And, and uh, you know, one thing, like I said, I, I encourage people to take a more minimalist approach and, and use maybe different styles of compressors if you need to do all that. There are definitely compressors that are optimized for for group compression, for vocal compression, for guitars, for basses, all that. For you fast know, compression or slow compression. Yeah. Something that gives color specifically or is really transparent specifically. Like knowing to- your tools is so important. Totally, totally. And, and same with like, when it comes to say spatial effects or saturation or distortion types, 
people will use the same thing over and over again. And it's like, well, what if, what if instead of using another reverb on this element, you use a delay to kind of simulate the same thing? What if this other element doesn't actually need a, another reverb on it, but it could just use a chorus with a little bit of feedback? What if, you know, you, you use this particular distortion on your drop bass and, and, and you want to use it on, a, I don't know, let's say a vocal or an effect or something like that, like maybe instead of uh, saturation, try some kind of tube distortion or try some kind of uh, like pedal like overdrive kind of thing. Like start experimenting with how to get similar flavors using different tools and don't use it unless you really need to use it. Um, like you're going to find yourself just like digging yourself a deeper hole. And then, like we said, when you go back and, and you take off these effects chains, you like, you kind of almost don't know what did what as you're rebuilding it because you just stacked plug in on top of plug in and you're not even fully sure why you necessarily made these moves. Yeah. And like, so true to like, this I've is even done. don't like, this is even a good reminder for myself. Like I am guilty of just reaching for the glue compressor every time if I need to compress something. But like, I know that I, there's three compressors in Ableton that are all great glue, the normal compressor and the multiband compressor, or you could clip it using the saturator if you wanted to compress. I mean, you could use that as a pseudo compressor or even distort to, to get a similar effect, like you were saying. And so at any stage, this is a good reminder that you need to try and be aware of your habits and, and how breaking out of those could potentially help things stand out more. Yeah. yeah. Amen. I mean, I th one, one thing I, I like kind of, learned about yesterday talking to ill gates about a track uh that he was helping me finish was uh using a wave shaper instead of a compressor in certain situations where it's like the compressor has to deal with time it's like there's this attack in this release knob and it's about how the sound moves dynamically over time whereas a wave shaper it's this curve where it's like, okay, if the amplitude of the wave is at this decibel level coming in, we're going to put the amplitude of the wave at that decibel level coming out. So it actually is like changing the dynamics of each individual wave cycle between the zero crossings. Like, and that's a completely different style. And sometimes that's correct. And it's like, this is, this is a tool. I've even had the exact one Ill Gates uses. It's the um, from Melda Productions. The it's um, free. The M, the M, it's M, a, M Wave Shaper. M Wave Shaper. Yeah, I had literally had it for months and months and just didn't know what it was, and so I never opened it. They've got a bunch of great tools in their free bundle. By the they way, Mel, shouts to Melda. Uh, I've been using a bunch of them, but this one uh, I'm gonna start using and. Another thing that that brings me into is we're talking about all these different ways to possibly achieve a similar result and they'll all be slightly different. And I have definitely been guilty of finding a way that I know works and then just grabbing it as my go-to, tossing it on there and then moving on to the next element as opposed to taking the time to say, okay, well, I need to change the dynamics of this sound. What is the best way? Let's take my go-to compressor. How does that sound? Okay, now let me mute that and put on the wave shaper. Okay, A, B, those. Okay, now what about the glue compressor? What about a saturator? What about a limiter? What about a tube analog em emulated limiter? And like testing a few of my options to make sure that the one I move forward with is actually the best tool out of the tools I have access to. And that's something that, that Ill Gates, we had, we had a long talk last night where he was, he was showing me, I had written the song. It was really close to being done, but there was some mix issues that just, I was unable to resolve. I had hit the limit of my understanding. And like, we're talking about I had been working on this song for so long that it just had layer and layer and layer of corrective processing on it. 
And so I just took a bunch of that processing off and sent Ill Gates the stems. And he took a way shorter path to finishing this song and showed me what he did. I'm like, oh my God, that is so much easier. And it's like, I, I was really making this hard on myself. And he was just showing me, he's got like five plugins on this element but only one of them's on. He's like, yeah, well, I tried this one and it was pretty good, but then I tried that one and it was definitely worse. And then I tried this one and it was like close to the other one, but a little better. And then, you know, and then I ended up landing on this one here and that's mm -hmm. the one I moved forward with. And then I went to the next track and I grabbed all five of those and I tested all five of them on that too. You know, and it's like, oh man, that makes so much sense as opposed to just like blindly grabbing the one I'm most comfortable with and assuming it did the job. And then later on finding out that, you know, some of that processing I put on is the whole reason I don't know how to finish this track. Mm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, I, I think too, it's like something worth noting is like, he technically could have went with any of those choices. And just because he chose that particular one doesn't necessarily mean it's the best for that context. But all of these mixing decisions you're making are stylistic choices, much like the way you sound design, much like how a vocalist comes in and they have a, a very specific way of projecting their voice and enunciating and all that. And and obviously Dylan is a is a great producer and, and he's got a very keen ear to these things. But I, I hear a lot of people being like, well, how do I know I made the right choice? How do I know this? How do I know this? And I heard a great analogy recently. Uh, shout out I Dream in Stereo. He was talking about um, how how a mix engineer's mix is kind of like uh, as if like three of us were to draw a boat, to, to, to draw a picture of a boat. We can all put a lot of detail into it, make a super high quality, all this, but it's going to be three different pictures at the end of the day. And I really like that analogy because first off, it gets you out of that mindset of like, am I making the right choices? Oh my God, this or that. And, and also because like we talked about earlier, regardless of how we approach drawing the picture of the boat, we're not going to use the same firmness and the same tool. Like, okay, you might use a pencil all the way throughout, but you're not just going to like fist it and then just drag it across the paper for every single detail. Like if you've ever seen those like uh, uh, time lapses of people painting like very elaborate stuff, like they're using different angles of the brush, they're using different sized brushes, they're, they're mixing like slight variations of the color, like all of these things in my mind are, are kind of like the equivalent of like knowing your tools. Like, you know, maybe Dylan didn't have to go with that compressor specifically, but there was there were other variables in the mix. Maybe it's the culmination of all the other plugins that were used across the other channels that left a specific space in the mix that this compressor filled specifically. So just something to think about too, because, you know, I, I understand that doubt and I felt for a couple years too, like, oh, well, this person is really preaching this and this person's really preaching this. And, and I was in that mindset of looking for that, like, one size fits all solution the one that would like give me the most bang for my buck and the thing is like yeah. there's just so many variables there you just you you test things out trust your ear and then just make sure you're not like treating everything like a nail and and hammering it in yeah man that's isn't that like the most classic like love all the noobs some days I still feel like a noob, but it's the most classic noob producer slash engineer question. Like, hey guys, just got into producing, wondering what's the best compressor settings for putting on a kick drum? And like, <laughs> well, well, what does the kick drum sound like? And what compressor are you using? And what is your objective for what you want the kick drum to sound like after the compressor? Like, what? Does it have too much transient? And you're trying to, pull the transient back well the really fast attack and release is it have not enough transient compared to body well then slower attack so that you keep the transient cursor right like there's so many variables and it's all you know it's it's both objective and subjective in that like you have an idea of what you think it should sound like and so subjectively you if it moves it closer to that 
it's pretty good. If it moves it all the way to that, it's really good. You know, if, if, and it's objective in the fact that like, you got to have an objective, like, what are you trying to go for? Like, know where you want to go. What's your reference track sound like? What does your genre do with this element? You know, if it's a folk song, the kick is going to sound a lot different from a dubstep song or else one of those engineers is doing it wrong. (laughs) 100%. And just A, B, everything. I mean, every mix decision I make nowadays is turning it off, turning it back on when I've made a change, volume leveling it, turning it off, turning it back on. Did I make it better? Yeah, great. Let's move on. Did I make it better? No? Okay, let's try again. Let's try something else. Just A, B, everything. So I think we've pretty, we've pretty well put a bow on that topic. Luke, you want to you wanna maybe talk about something that you found to objectively ruin most things? Yeah, um, kind of indiscriminate use of EQ and filters mm. is something I've been looking at lately. Um, like I took a, a really good vocal mixing course from uh, soundoracle.com where they like break it down like all the different you know, stages and all the different applications of how to use each type of tool. Um, And on the section about EQ and filters, they were talking about how a mistake a lot of people use or a a lot of people commit is using too steep of a filter curve. Um, So, you know, like say, you know, we're let's, let's take a couple common ones. One will take the EQ8 in Ableton. It's got the the regular filter and then it's got the 4x filter where it becomes a much steeper filter and it 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 takes away a lot sound a lot faster the problem is the faster you're cutting off that sound the more phase issues you're going to get near the near the filter cutoff and that can then rebalance the sound in a way you weren't intending so that like, oh, well, I just want to cut out the low end rumble, but I'm really aggressively going to cut it out, which changes the way my low mid sound, which makes the, the harshness of the high mids much more pronounced. And now because of this one EQ move I made mistakenly or, you know, with, without thinking about it, all of a sudden now I have to make eight more EQ moves to try and fix my first EQ move that really, if you had left that low end rumble might not have ever been audible anywhere in the song and couldn't maybe wouldn't have mattered at all. 100%. Yeah. And that, then, and that steep and that steep filter cutoff creates resonance too. Yeah. it creates a big resonance at that steep filter cutoff. And then you're going to, you know, a lot of people will just make a, like you said, the steepest cutoff at 150 Hertz and like, great, I know the low end's gone. Well, now you kind of made a resonant peak in like a pretty sensitive area. Yeah. Yeah, continue. Um, yeah, and and uh, another another thing that I, I was talking to Ill Gates about, like I had not used the super steep filter, but I was filtering out like um, I had these, these strings as the most of the instrument of the track, these string chords. And um, the... I had placed the filter right below the fundamental frequency of the lowest note. And what Ill Gates was telling me was it's a much better practice if you need to filter out the bottom end. Start that filter like an octave below your fundamental frequency, which for anybody that doesn't know fundamental frequency, it's like the main, generally the loudest and lowest frequency in a sound. It's like what the root note is and then everything above that is a harmonic. But um, not cutting off so close to that frequency because, again, you're creating resonance and possible phase issues at that spot that is the most important thing as opposed to giving that, f- that fundamental frequency more space below the filter. And having seen what Ilg- I had used all sorts of EQs all over my track and progressively more with each version. You know, I was on version mix seven or something where I'd like saved as seven times that I had not saved as a lot more times than that uh, along the way. So I had done a lot of mixes and each time I had added, Oh, a couple little more EQ. Oh, it's, I noticed it's a little harsh. So let me add another EQ note here. And Oh, it's like a little bit. And so just like compounding problems over and over and over. And then watching Ill Gates do the same thing, you know, mix the same track. It was like, Oh man, he like 
barely used any EQs relative to my mix. Like a, fr- a small fraction of the amount of EQ instances and the amount of EQ moves that he had done. And just kind of realizing like, okay, this has been one of the tools I understand the best and I know how to work the buttons on it, but it's not necessarily always the most necessary thing to EQ every track, which brings me to a next point I would love to bring up. Starting with sounds that kind of suck. Oh. instead of sounds that sound great. If you have a great recording or a great sample, you don't need to do that many EQ moves on it or that much compression or whatever Defend. you think is going to fix the sound, right? Like, you know, I'm starting to like rethink my whole philosophy here and be like, man, maybe, maybe, just maybe, what's just starting with the best sounds I have You know, like it's great to be able to like take an okay sound and make it sound better. That's a good skill, especially if you're engineering somebody else's work where you can't say, hey, you should probably replace that hi-hat. You got to know how to perform surgery on the hi-hat. But if it's your song and the hi-hat doesn't sound good and you find yourself making wild EQ moves, change the sample. Yeah. Yeah. I did that on a on a house tune I was working on the other day, and I got the note like, "Oh, I'm really." F-. Bill Gates said he he was digging the track. He likes the feel. The hi hats don't sound that good. Blah blah blah. They need some work. They're a little harsh. And coming off of this other track where I've been trying to fix everything with EQs, I was just like, "Okay, screw it. I'm just gonna mute that whole track and remake the pattern with different hats." And basically did no EQ on the new hats. I just picked ones I really liked the sound of in the library and did almost nothing to them. And they sound so much better. And there's no shame if you find a group or even just one sample that you love that sounds good in the mix every time. You can use that sound in half, three quarters of the songs you release. That is fun. All of them. Like I learned that early on from an interview with audion that i heard i was making music kind of like him in the time you know two three years of production and he was like i use the same kick drum in every song and at the time i was like oh oh Oh. blasphemy you can't you can't be pro and use the same kick drum what are you what are you what are you doing and then i realized that the only reason you would think that you can't is is just beginner mindset. Like, oh, like I'm worried people aren't going to think the song is cool because it's the same kick as the last song. No one's fucking paying attention to that. Like, does the, does the chord sound like, does the song work great? Like that's what matters. And like, so I've, I've adopted that. Like there's a ride symbol that I found years ago and Every time I need a ride cymbal, I try that one first because it is so good and sounds so pristine. And I know I can pretty much use no EQ and just get it at the right volume and it's going to sound good. And like, you know, two thirds of the songs, like it is the one. And then like the other third, like I'll find something else that has a bit different of a tone. But like same thing with like snare layers. There's like a layer that I use for like high end, like snap and like crispiness. And a layer that I like to use for like low end, like oomph and weight, like almost sub in the snare. And I use that in like half my songs. Like there is no shame in that. If it works and it sounds great, go ahead. Like if it's not the main lead sound that you just use. And even if it is, some people build an entire genre around using the same lead sound in everything. Mm-hmm. Like totally. If it works, don't be afraid to use it again. But you know, also trust your taste. If it's, but if it's a drum or something yeah. like that, who cares? You guys know what I'm Man, saying. It's uh, I don't know shit about cars, but if you are building a car, you don't need every type of accelerator and every type of this shit and that shit and this and that. You just need something that reliably works within this system that you've created. You don't yeah. take a, a Lambo whatever part and add it into a, like a Honda engine. 
it's just it just makes absolutely no sense but for that honda engine or for the lambo engine there is a system that has been put into place and that system is your sound if you're defining your sound you don't need all the ride symbols in the world you don't need a, a ride that would be used for country or some shit like that because like you said evan like you have a very cohesive consistent style and you found something that fulfills that purpose in the way that you like it in your system so why fix it if it ain't broke amen and like just to dog pile on that i once saw timbaland give an interview and one of the q and a's from the audience was like yo like where do you get your snare sounds and he's like, well, man, usually I like, I like make them, like I take different things and I layer them together lately. Pretty much. I've just been using this one called snare five. Cause I made like eight, eight snare samples and number five was the best one. So it's just literally called snare five. And I use it in almost all of my songs. Exactly. And that's Timbaland. Exactly. How are you going to argue that? Like even- he beat back, he beat boxes on every beat. He, oh no, quick. We need somebody else to beat box on this one. Cause I beat box on the last one. <laughs> yeah, I, dude. Even like, even like Nero. If you listen to this podcast, you know I revere them as like one of my top three biggest influences. Oh really? Oh really? <laughs> and I found like a really old like forum post from them. Just like stumbled across it. That was like them in like 2008 talking about their production process, and they were like, "Yeah, we use pretty much the same snare, like." The, the whole snare, like the same exact snare in almost every song. And I was like, thank God. Like, it, it, like even the best of the best, the people I revere as being innovators and like technically sound, like they basically, yeah, they resampled and compressed and got this one beefy snare. They're like, this snare is sick. And then they just used it in everything. Like, good. Simplify the process. Take decisions out of the process if you already have something that works. Side note that's pretty funny. In that same post, some guy was like, oh, yeah, I saw you guys here. Like, it was the best show ever. Like, when you guys, like, you know, doing your next show or whatever. And Nero in 2008 was like, yeah, well, we don't really have a whole lot of gigs lined up. Like, hopefully, like, our stuff starts taking off pretty soon and we'll get some more bookings. And, like, we are all at that point. At, at some level, even, yep. even Nero are at one point we're like, Oh man, we feel like we're making good music, but we hope we get some bookings like good. Amen. Good. So Tesco, let's, let's move on to you. What's your objectively ruining thing for making music or a object, man, I would say that main thing of like using the same plugin for too many contexts. Yeah. A lot of times I'll see it within um, uh, uh, like when it comes to spatial effects, if people are like trying to give something space in a mix, they'll put like five reverbs with the same or very similar settings on on, you know, five different elements. And they'll be like, why is my mix muddy? Um, you know, first being like, uh, Luke, I always, always, always echo this piece of advice you gave me. You got to be focused on when the sound ends just as much as you are when the sound begins. Because first off, that reverb tail needs to sit in some sort of pocket. It might not be three seconds. It might be 3.33 seconds. And then the next one that sits in pocket might be 2.67 seconds and not 2.44, right? So like, first off, those small changes are going to make a difference. But I find personally when it comes to reverb, I try to use one, uh, like have one instrument in my whole mix with reverb, basically. At most, I will do two, but then I will make sure that one is a very big, long room reverb and one is a more narrow, less stereo, shorter room reverb. Um, but past that, I find um, putting, putting a delay on. So now... Uh, uh, my third reverb or and, and fourth reverb will probably be a delay at maybe one fourth and then maybe another delay at like one sixteenth, one thirty second, right? And and before I do any of that, I'm also going to ask myself like, does this actually need to occupy more horizontal space across time, or does it just need a little bit of 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 stereo uh, like spread? 
right? So any any quote unquote two dimensional sound you bring into the mix, whether it's a really dry sample, whether it's something you recorded. Uh, given there's no room ambience, is going to sound two-dimensional until you apply a bit of these spatial effects. So if it doesn't need a reverb or a delay, you could probably get away with using a chorus or a phaser or a flanger or something like that. And uh, that's kind of how I classify these effects mentally. So uh, like a delay basically is a reverb or, or, or vice versa, sorry. A reverb is just a delay where all of the reflections are so close together, it forms a continuous tail. So if you want something that is kind of reverby, but but kind of uh, like I mentally, I think of it as like if you were watching a movie, you took like every fifth frame, you could still get an idea of what's going on. It would just be a little bit choppier, a little bit more separated. Right. Um, so so that's kind of how I view those two, I kind of classify them together. Uh, the reverb is obviously the more natural sounding one. Um, and then uh, my choruses, my phasers, my uh, uh, flangers, stuff like that, I kind of view them like the blur tool in Photoshop. So the same way you'd have like Gaussian blur and blah, blah, blah. You have these tools available to you. And again, you don't need to use every single one. If you've already used two choruses in your mix, Either try a different chorus plugin that just has a different algorithm to it. Try a phaser, try a flanger, and 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 really get a feel for like how it, how much, and how it actually spreads this two dimensional sound and makes it more three D uh, by like giving a bit more to the sides. You know, um, I feel like that is where I see like a lot of issues. So I'm really passionate when it comes to like filling out that full 3d mix cube and that third dimension of depth i find is is often hardest to get so um you know i just want to encourage people to take a bit more consideration into like how they're using their spatial effects which elements are getting spatial effects be very conscious for example if you're using a reverb it's sucking things back into your mix you can't fit a 20 piece band on a two foot by two foot stage but if you're putting 10 reverbs with the same exact settings on 10 different elements, you're essentially trying to cram 10 band members in the same place in the mix. And, and yeah, it's just, it's going to sound off, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, in a nutshell, like don't use the same effect on too many instruments. If you do use a, let's say chorus on multiple elements, try different plugins with different algorithms, different models, uh, and, and also just, just vary things up a little, like, yeah, a hundred percent. I want to drop, I want to drop two more little nuggets on top Please. that are related that we don't need to dive into too far, but, uh, bounce and flatten everything in your mix by the time that you're done and cut off those tails. Like you were saying, you pay attention to when the sound ends, like cut everything off to the absolute bare minimum of when it can end. If another sound starts and you cut it off at the start of that next sound and you don't notice anything feeling weird, that is the right spot to have it cut off. Maybe even before that, but cut, bounce, flatten in place, everything so it's audio and chop the tails. The other thing is, like you said, you can't have 20 band members on a two foot by two foot stage. Don't overcomplicate things. When you're, when you're mixing things down, if you don't need that element, turn it off, delete it, be okay with going without it. Like use as minimum, uh, like as little elements as you need to get your point across with the song and that's it. Yeah, it's just like drugs. Minimum effective <laughs> dose. Yes. Exactly. Too much and you'll just have a headache. <laughs> yes, or OD your mix. True. Yeah, man. Don't overdose your mix with reverb. <laughs> Or yeah. EQ or whatever. Any effect. Any effect. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know mostly every DAW has multiple types of distortion. And I very rarely see people experimenting with all the different types. You know? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of a lot of what we've said today can be summarized with A B everything and yes. use your ears. Yes. Like, yeah. oh, oh, this could work. What about the other plugin I have that does basically the same thing? Oh, shit, that's better. Like people, we, we talked about people having that fear of, oh, what, how do I know which one's the right one? 
Trust your ears. Your ears and, might tell you wrong, but you will learn from that. And notice, and notice that pretty much nothing that we've talked about today is a creative or songwriting decision. Because when you're writing the music, there are no wrong answers. Yeah. If it works, it works. Uh, I thought of one more thing I keep forgetting to say. I know it's super obvious, but I feel like it must be stated. Before you reach for any plugin, fuck the tutorial you saw this morning. Screw what your friend told you. You need to first ask yourself, what am I trying to change about this sound? And then yes. ask yourself what tool actually does that. Don't slap a compressor on it just because you saw a compression tutorial that morning. Don't you put need to <laughs> you need to know that this sound has too much dynamic range. I'm trying to close in on that. Yeah. Don't put if, three OTTs on it just because Barely Alive did it. <laughs> I mean, you don't need no, you don't <laughs> need to do that. You could. And, I mean, and again, try it. Listen to what it does and then turn them off and be like, what did it sound like a second ago? Is Was it better? After you volume metric? match it. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. Couldn't have yeah. said it better. Yeah. Use your ears, people. You know, and, yeah. and go make mistakes and learn from them. We all have, you know, like, it's not the end of the world if you mess up your mix. Hit save as, delete the processing, and try again. You know, it's iterative. Like, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. I met a 25-year mixing veteran who has songs on the radio for big rappers and stuff, like really knows what he's doing. And he told me that every three months, he is a better mixing engineer that could go back to a three-month-old mix and do it better. He doesn't because that song's already on the radio. But he listens to it and be like, mm, yeah, I actually could have made that kick slap a little harder. Or, oh, you know what? That new reverb I just got probably would have, made that vocal sit in the space a little better you know like it never ends it's a never ending rabbit hole there the, i heard this on a podcast today the bad news is you're falling the good news is there's no ground <laughs> <laughs> man that's a good uh metaphor yeah. for life man there it is um man. man yeah that that reminds me to uh you know not to keep being a dead horse here but i uh my friend showed me a uh uh, it was uh, like Drake's nomination of like the greatest artist of the last decade. And he was even talking about how he's it's like, yeah, like I don't celebrate because I hear everything I do wrong in these these songs and, and every single thing I put out, I'm breaking it down and thinking how I could have done better. And I'm like, damn, man, that's that's the one of the biggest artists in the world, like like one of the most streamed people ever. And he's still like, nah, I don't, I don't fuck with it. It's got to be better. Yeah. Well, all right, humans. If, uh, if we miss something that's like a really good thing that, that you know about or that you just learned or that, that keeps fucking you up, please drop us a comment on YouTube, send us a message on Facebook, hit us in an Instagram, whatever. Like, you know, I'm sure there's plenty we didn't cover in this little episode. Uh, and so, you know, we can do a part two or just give you a shout out in one of our future episodes for it. So, yeah, we go, let chat. us know. We go. We go. We go. <laughs> All right. All right, humans. Peace out for this week. And guess what? Peace among worlds. Woo. Humans, thank you so much for joining us again on episode 65. Wow, 65 through already. If you haven't yet, make sure to smash that subscribe, smash the like, hit the notification bell on YouTube, rate and review on iTunes, like Mr. Bill says, unless you're going to be a little bitch about it. And, uh, you know, just make sure you share this with a producer friend. You know they could use these, this good information too, and we can grow this community and get this dope info to even more producers. Shouts to our sponsors, Dojo TV, free producer live stream classes from the producer Dojo Senseis, the weekly download where you can learn from Ill Gates directly in his private weekly group lessons and get instant access to over 230 more episodes in the archive for just 20 bucks a month. And guest practices where you can learn from Seth Drake at the Approach Institute. He's the best engineer we know, and he lets you get the first class for free. Can't beat that. 
Uh, make sure again hit those links and the links to listen to Rip Kenny's remix of Ion Eyes Look What I Got featuring 42 Doug, Kevin Jacobs, and Des Eagle and give the rest of that dope remix EP some spins as well. We know you're gonna like that. Jams. All right, till next week, y'all. Peace and peace among worlds. I like it. <laughs>